drops are falling on my head And just like the guy whose feet are too big for his bed Nothing seems to fit Those raindrops are falling on my head And they keep falling Well, good morning and welcome to Northridge Church. My name's Aaron Hickson. I'm the youth pastor here and whether you're joining us from Aranaquit or Greece or Webster or online during the week, we're really glad that you're here. And uh, we're going to be continuing in our series called Overwhelmed, just talking about how, especially at this time of year, we can all begin to feel the burn of our schedules and all the things we have going on. And we're just talking about how we can get off the treadmill of life. And uh, if you were here last week, you might remember that Nate Miller, our Webster campus pastor, actually gave his talk from a treadmill. Um, I will not be talking from a treadmill. I might be the youngest member of our staff, but I am not the fittest member of our staff. So if I walked on a treadmill the whole time, I would be so embarrassed that you would be embarrassed. So I'm actually doing you a favor and you can thank me later. So uh, no, we're you know, we, we all have a different response to stress. Like, we, we, we have difficult things that come along, and we all handle them a little differently. And uh, when I think about stressful times or, you know, tough times in my life, I think about um, when I was in seminary, I was taking probably too many credits all at once, and I was taking Hebrew and Greek, which are the two languages that most of the Bible is written in, taking those both at the same time, so trying to cram all those vocab words and get it all in. And my Hebrew class met twice a week uh, from 6.30 in the morning until 9.00. And on Tuesdays, I had a class Hebrew from 6.30 to 9, I had a class from 9 to 10, and then I had a different class from 10 to 1. So essentially every Tuesday, I was in class for, you know, six and a half hours or whatever, and just the way that it worked out with the classes I was taking, I actually had the same professor all day. So I would get up, you know, I wasn't getting nearly enough sleep, I'm going to bed way, way, way too late, getting up way, way, way too early, and spending all day in the same uh, classroom with the same guy for however my schedule had worked that way, and I just... Man, I would get to the end of those Tuesdays. It's one o'clock, and it felt like about 11.30 at night. My brain was totally, completely fried. I was worn out, tired, just stressed. So I would, my ritual became that I would get done with class at one o'clock. I would drive to lunch where I would meet Lauren, my then fiance, now my wife, and we would eat lunch together, and then I would drive her to her dorm. And um, I would, we'd go to the, get to her dorm, and I would just kind of park, and we'd talk for a couple minutes. And I got to this place where every week, I would, we, we would park the car, and I would lean back in my seat. I would just like lay it all the way back, and I would just hit this wall. And I would, <laughs> I would have like this existential quandary where I would start asking all these like deep questions. Sometimes it was really serious. Like, you know, do I really want to be a pastor? Am I really on the right path in my life? But most of the time, it was completely ridiculous, and I would just start questioning. I would lean back, and I would be like, you know, what, what is the nature of true learning? What does it even mean to learn something? How does the brain work? And I would just, you know, these questions are like completely random, but my brain was so fried. I, you know, how do, how do I even gain this information? And then I would eventually start questioning, like, am I even real is this going to be forever? I'm just like totally fried, you know. And at the end of this, Lauren is <laughs> listening the whole time, just like, what is he doing? And I would talk myself out of believing that I was real or that Lauren was real. And then I would talk myself into believing in extraterrestrials and everything from the movie The Matrix. So, I mean, I was just totally a mess. And Lauren is really great, man. She's really patient with me. And so she would be like, uh, Aaron, I think you might need to take a nap. And I'd be like, no, I'm fine. I just don't understand my destiny. And she's like, she's backing away slowly. I really think you need to take a nap. <laughs> like, I'll see you later. And I'm like, okay. I'd go back to my dorm. I'd take a nap and I'd be totally fine. But week after week, I just got blindsided by this. I just never saw it coming, which is kind of sad. But, you know, just every week questioning everything for this like 20 minute period, nothing in my life made sense. And at this point, you're probably wondering, why does he work with our high school students? <laughs> um, 
But no, you know, we, we all have these moments where, you know, life gets really tough and we, we have this default response to the difficult circumstances of our life. So, you know, for you, maybe it's the expenses that are piling up and you don't know how you're going to pay those bills or the assignments that there's just way too many of them to get them all done. Or maybe it's, you know, this one room in your house that you can never really seem to get clean. Or, you know, the, the to-do list that it's getting so long and complicated that you've started writing like eat lunch on there so you'll actually get around to eating. You know, maybe you're there or... Um, You know, the portfolio that's just collapsing because of whatever's going on in the market and you can't control that. Or the diagnosis for someone that you love or maybe for you that you know is going to change your life forever. Or maybe, you know, the relationship ending decision that seems like it's right around the corner or the market reversal that puts your job at risk or maybe your whole division's job at risk. And in those moments, we all have a default response to that stressor, to the difficult circumstances of life. And probably... Uh, If I had to guess, the most common response to those difficult circumstances is worry, right? I mean, we all, we respond to the difficult circumstances of our life with worry, you know, so you start to ask like the what if questions and maybe your stomach starts turning and your hands get kind of sweaty and your brain gets foggy and nothing really makes sense. That, that feeling that we've all had, you know, that's worry. That's, that's the response to the difficult circumstance. And so maybe I would, I would say it this way, that worry, worry is a temptation that arises when what we want is threatened by what we can't control. The temptation to worry arises when what we want is threatened by what we can't control. So, you know, whatever it is that we want, whether that's, you know, the bills to go to the playoffs or, you know, great kids or, uh, you know, a portfolio that's huge or retirement time that's going to be easy or, um, you know, a house that perfectly fits our specifications or a spouse that we really, you know, love and, and love to be around, whatever it is that we want most. When that is threatened by what we can't control, like the economy or, you know, bad grades from the past or just way too many things piling up at once or, you know, the weather or our job loss or whatever it is. When when what we want is threatened by what we can't control, this temptation arises for us to begin to worry. And I don't think, and I don't think any of us are exempt from that. We've all been there and maybe you are there right now. So if this is a common experience, whether, you know, whatever stage of life you're in that we respond with worry... What does the Bible have to say about it? What, what does God say is true about worry? And if you would, we're going to talk about that today. If you would turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 6. If you're using one of our Bibles, uh, that's on page 787. 787 if you use one of our Bibles. Matthew chapter 6. Um, Matthew's the first book of the New Testament. It's an eyewitness account of the life of Jesus. Uh, written by a guy that knew him well, who was there. And this section, Matthew 5 through 7, is actually a sermon that Jesus gave. If, if your Bible puts the words of Jesus in red, some Bibles do that, this whole, maybe this whole page and the page before it or so will all be in red because Jesus, this is a sermon that he gave that got recorded for us and it's kind of this extended time of Jesus talking. And he talks about a lot of different things, but we're going to jump in in Matthew chapter 6, starting uh, in verse 25. And so... Yeah, let's, let's just go ahead and, and jump in there right there. Matthew 25, 6, 25, I'm sorry. It says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. This is Jesus talking. And whenever the Bible says, therefore, you, you've heard this before. Whenever, whenever the Bible says, therefore, we want to check and see what the therefore is there for. So what comes before it? But we're, we're actually going to do that a little later. So for now, we're just going to focus on verse 25. And it says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. So that's it. Thanks for being here at Northridge Church today. I hope you enjoyed that. No. Uh, You know, none of us really respond that well when someone just says, do this because I said so. Right? You know, we don't tend to like that. And Jesus is going to outline a whole bunch of really, really, really good reasons why we should not worry. So let's, let's go back to verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. I I love this, um, you know, I love this section of the Bible because uh, I, I get to work with high school students. That's a big part of my job is, is hanging out with high schoolers. And so every once in a while, they'll decide to like climb something or eat something or wear something or jump off of something that I have to kind of look at them and be like, you know, do I really need to outline the like 20 to 45 reasons why that's a terrible idea? Like, you're really going to have to, I'm going to have to spell that out for you, like, seriously. Uh, maybe if you've, 
hung out with high schoolers, or maybe if you are a high schooler, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but this section of the Bible, the reason I like it is I, I can picture Jesus kind of saying, like, he's just going to outline the, the many, many, many reasons why worry is a total waste of our time. In fact, you could probably call this section just the worthlessness of worry. He's just going to outline why this is a total waste of our time. So, Let's look at verse 25 again. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food? I mean, seriously, isn't our life about something more significant than just gathering and then eating food? Isn't there something more? Or he goes on, and the body, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Isn't our body for some bigger purpose than just like the fabric that's hanging on it? Jesus is just making this clear. And he goes on in verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. He's going to use some examples from everyday life. He says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. You've never seen a bird that's a farmer, right? You know, they don't, they don't go out and like sow seed and have many acres and harvest it at the appropriate times and store it in barns, some for their families, some for the selling at the market. Like birds don't do that, right? And yet Jesus says, they don't store away in barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? I mean, Jesus is just making it super clear. Like birds are pretty low on the totem pole of importance in terms of this world, right? They're pretty low. Humans, us, we are significantly higher. And God is saying, look, God, Jesus is saying God provides for birds. He provides them with food. They don't have to worry about that. You can trust God to provide for you. You can trust that we're of much greater importance than birds and God provides for them. We can we can count on him to provide for our food. And then he, he just continues on in verse uh, 27. This is, this is actually one of my favorite statements of Jesus because it's so crystal clear and it actually, uh, I can't prove this, but I think you know, Jesus could have almost said this sarcastically, okay? So he goes, verse 27, he says this. Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Which you know, that's pretty true, right? I mean, when we worry, none of us, when we, you know, we go through a difficult time when we worry about it a lot, when we, when we get through that difficult time, when we look back, I don't think any of us are like, wow, yeah, I am really glad I spent all that time worrying. Like, yeah, that made me way more productive. In fact, I, I liked that worry phase so much that I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to write an implementation strategy for how others can begin integrating worry into their workflow for increased productivity and efficiency in the workplace. Like, we don't do that, right? Because worry is a total waste of time. And Jesus is saying, look, you can't, you, you can't add a single hour to your life when you worry. It's a waste of time. Why would you do that? Let's continue on. Verse 28. Jesus says, and why do you worry about clothes? He's already addressed food. That's a big concern of ours, maybe daily provision. Now he's going to go on to clothes, which is, you know, daily provision, but then also our image, like the way people think about us. He says in verse 28, why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. You know, you've never seen a flower uh, that's a seamstress or like a flower that's reading a fashion magazine, right? They don't do that. And yet, Jesus says in verse 29, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. And maybe, maybe if, you know, if you're new to the Bible, or you're new to church, maybe that Solomon thing doesn't really connect with you. But Jesus, what he's saying here, Solomon to his audience, the people he was talking to, would have been like the epitome of the guy who had whatever he want, whenever he wanted, and was really into stuff being nice, like beautiful and magnificent and exquisite. Solomon was known for being like top notch in that area of his life. So for you, you know, you can insert here for Solomon, you can insert whoever it is in your life, whoever you think has whatever they want, whenever they want, and they're really into especially exquisite clothing, okay? So, you know, not even a GQ model and all of their splendor was dressed as one of these. Jesus is just trying to make the point that even, you know, flowers who don't ever worry about the way that they're dressed, yet God provides for them, not just, you know, like in a shabby way, but in a magnificent way, God provides for them. I mean, birds eat, flowers are well attired. God provides for these things, that they're low on the totem pole of importance. And, you know, he even spells out his argument in verse 30. Jesus says, you know, if, if that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? I mean, if God is providing for these tiny, tiny parts of the world that have such a short shelf life, don't you think, don't you think he's able to provide for you and me? 
Then in verse uh, 31 and 32, this is another great statement. So Jesus says, so do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what are we going to drink? Or what are we going to wear? Because the pagans run after these things. The people who don't follow after God, they chase after these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. I mean, God's God's not sitting in heaven. You know, when we start to worry, when our circumstances you get really crazy and we start to worry about stuff and, you know, we're getting stressed out, God doesn't get like a notification on his smartphone like, oh, wow, I totally forgot humanity needed food and clothes. Like, I'm so glad they reminded me. Your heavenly father already knows you need them. He's been providing for all of creation, for all of eternity. He's got this under control. You don't have to worry. So, you know, I think you could essentially summarize what Jesus has said right here by just, you know, saying God is trustworthy. God is trustworthy. Uh, if, if, you know, we said that the temptation to worry arises when what we want is threatened by what we can't control, then what Jesus is essentially saying to us right here is that you can trust God to control what you can't control. You can trust God to control what you can't control. He's been providing for creation for forever. And if The temptation to worry arises when what we want is threatened by what we can't control. Then Jesus is saying, you can trust God to control what you can't control. So, if I'm Jesus, and I just like made this airtight argument for why worry is a total waste of time, why you you can trust God, and I get all the way down to verse 32 in this sermon, my next line, my like clincher on this argument would just simply be, therefore, do not worry, trust God. That's what I would say. Therefore, do not worry. Trust God. But it's weird. Look at verse 33. That's not what Jesus says. Check it out. In verse 33, he says, But, so instead of worry, seek first his kingdom. That's God's kingdom. And his righteousness. That's God's righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Wow, that's weird. That, that's weird to me. You know, like I said, if, if, I had to, if I had to guess what was coming next, he just proved that God is trustworthy. I would assume he's going to say, trust God, but he doesn't. He says, seek first the kingdom of God. He says, instead of worry, seek God's kingdom. Seek his righteousness. Why would he do that? That's weird. Well, I, I, think, I think that this is why. It's because trust is actually not the ultimate solution to worry. Trust is not the ultimate solution to worry. Yeah, God is trustworthy, but trust is not the ultimate solution to worry. It's an initial step, but there's more. And it matters because, get this, if the only reason we shouldn't worry is because God is trustworthy to provide us with our daily needs, then what happens if God doesn't provide for our daily needs? What happens if God seemingly isn't trustworthy Because maybe we don't experience that right now, but you can look throughout history and see that lots of people who have followed after God, they've gone without food. And people who have followed after God, they've gone without clothes. So what do they do in that moment? If God seemingly isn't trustworthy to provide for their daily needs, does that mean that they get to worry? This command suddenly doesn't apply to them because God supposedly didn't come through? I don't think that's the case. But why? Why is it? It's because this section about the fact that God is trustworthy, that you can trust God to control what you can't control, is based on something else. Remember, this section started with therefore. So we need to go back and see what is this section based on? What's the truth that it's based on? And it starts in verse 19. So we're going to check out verse 19 and see what Jesus has to say. But what he says there, he's going to start talking about treasure. Jesus in verse 19 is going to start talking about treasure. You might say, treasure? Wait, what, what does treasure have to do with anything? Well, this, this is what I think he's doing here. The section we just talked about, remember we said the temptation to worry arises when what we want is threatened by what we can't control. What we just discussed is that God is trustworthy. And so that was all about what we can't control. That's, that was the section about what we can't control. And you can trust God to control what you can't control. But this next section, starting in verse 19, Jesus is going to go after what we want. Jesus is going to go after what we want. Starting in verse 19, he's going to start talking about treasure. Because we are all, we are all ultimately treasure hunters. We're treasure seekers. We live our lives chasing after something that we have personally deemed to be valuable. Um, 
you know, we, we probably all know somebody that collects stuff. Maybe you collect stuff. I'm not much of a collector myself. I used to collect, uh, like, baseball cards. And, you know, there, there are things that people are into collecting that's pretty normal. You know, people collect stamps or, like, all the state quarters or they try to collect baseball cards or football cards or, you know, whatever. There are some things that people collect that are pretty normal. But then there are some other things that people collect that, maybe for me, I think they're a little weird. Like, people are into collecting, like, Pez dispensers or, like, Star Trek outfits, or, uh, you know, like cars that don't work, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. And they're the kind of thing where, please don't be offended. If you're that person, I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, when you go over to their house, they're like, I want to show you my awesome collection of 30 bazillion Pez dispensers. And I'm like, great. So like, you know, you walk in the room and it's just like racks and racks and racks of this stuff. And you're like, wow, this is really cool. But internally, you're writhing, like, I can't believe they actually spent money on this stuff. This is junk. But, you know, the, you can laugh at that. Pest dispensers are weird. <laughs> um, but, uh, no, so, you know, those people, really, they reveal what's true about all of our hearts. That we're all chasing after something that we have determined in our hearts to be valuable. So in verse 19, Jesus is going to talk about what we want. And he's going to tell us what type of treasure we should be seeking. So let's, let's check it out. This is verse 19. Let's see what Jesus have to say, has to say about the type of treasure we should be seeking. He says this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and they steal. Jesus is telling us here in this verse, he's telling us not to chase treasure that's going to rot. He tells us, don't chase treasure that's going to rot. Because almost everything in our life, right, when we get down to it, the stuff that we can put our hands on, it's all got an expiration date. Someday that stuff is either going to burn or it's going to be stolen or it's going to be sold in an estate sale or it's going to rot away in a storage container somewhere. Just about everything in our life has an expiration date. And so Jesus is telling us, don't chase treasure that's going to rot. Don't spend your life chasing that. There's an alternative. There's something better. And he says it in verse 20. He says, instead, but store up for yourselves treasure In heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. There is a better alternative. For for those of us who are Christ followers, we can chase after a treasure that cannot be destroyed, that cannot be stolen, that cannot rot, that does not have an expiration date. In fact, um, Peter, who was a disciple of Jesus, a guy who walked around with him while he was on earth, he likely, you know, heard this very sermon, and he went on later to write a letter where he wrote this in 1 Peter chapter 1. He starts off and says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So there's this introduction, and then he gets to this, this end part. He says, We've we've been born into a resurrection and into an inheritance, a treasure that can never perish, never spoil, or fade. Jesus, I mean, Peter picked up on this theme from Jesus that we can chase an inheritance, a treasure that can never perish, never spoil, and never fade. And Jesus is telling us, chase after that kind of treasure. Chase after treasure that will never pass away. But what You know, what what in the world does this have to do with worry? What what are we even talking about right now with this treasure? Well, verse 21, I think, ties them together. He says this, verse 21 of Matthew 6, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, what we are chasing reveals what it is that matters to us. What we're chasing, where your treasure is, what you're seeking, there your heart will be also. That's what matters to you. The way, the the things that we're chasing after in our life reveal what it is that matters most to us in our daily life. And, um, you know, in verse 22 and 23, the next verses, Jesus just uses like a word picture to describe the fact that this is not an area of our life where we can hide. The way that we live absolutely and inevitably will reveal what it is that matters most to us. That's verse 22 and 23. And then in 24, Jesus kind of nails down this argument. He says, verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. In other words, we can't hide in this area of our life, and we have got to choose. You cannot serve 
both God and money. You cannot chase both treasure in heaven and treasure on earth. We have to choose. We cannot hide this area of our life. What we are chasing will reveal what it is that matters to us. And get this. The choice that we make on that issue, what treasure we will seek, the choice that we make on that issue will determine whether or not we ever have to worry again. The choice that we make on that issue will determine whether or not we ever have to worry again. Because if the temptation to worry arises when what we want is threatened by what we can't control, We can trust God to control what we can't control, but the only invincible defense, the only defense that can last against anything, the only invincible defense against worry is to want something that's invincible. The only invincible defense against worry is to want something that's invincible. Jesus wasn't satisfied to simply give us a temporary or a partial solution to worry. He isn't satisfied to just say, I'm trustworthy, so trust me and don't worry. He wants to give us an invincible defense. And the only invincible defense is to want something that's invincible, which is why he says, seek treasure in heaven rather than treasure on earth. It's why he says, serve God rather than stuff. And it's why after he's demonstrated perfectly that God is trustworthy, that he can and provide for our daily needs. He doesn't say, therefore, trust. He says, therefore, seek the kingdom of God. Because the only invincible defense against worry is to want something that's invincible, to want something that is insulated from all of the circumstances of our life that cannot be threatened by anything that happens in our lives. The only invincible defense against worry is to want something that's invincible. So how do we do it? How how do we get practical with this? How could we actually go about developing this invincible defense against worry? To want something that's invincible. Treasure in heaven, the kingdom of God, serving God rather than stuff. How do we actually do that? Well, I think that there's a couple, a couple steps we need to take. The first steps are kind of initial steps. They're, uh, they're not the ultimate solution, but they're, they're good steps in the right direction. And then there's a couple things that I think we need to do that really provide us with that invincible defense. So, uh, first of all, I think the first thing that we need to do uh, is to identify our worry zones. We need to identify our worry zones. What, what is it in your life that when you think about it, you know, it's the thing that keeps you up at night. It's the key thing that prevents you from sleeping well. It's the thing that, you know, causes kind of this wrenching in your stomach when you start to think about it. It's, it's what makes you lose concentration at work. What, what is that? We've all got them. You know, we, we've all got 10 of them. <laughs> Whether it's, you know, your kids or your job or your spouse or your house or wanting to get a degree that will help you take the next step or, you know, whether it's your relationships or your status in front of other people or your relationship status or your influence, you know, whatever it is for you. We've all got worry zones. And it's just a good step of self-awareness to begin to identify what those things specifically are. Identify our worry zones. We all need to do this. And that I think in those specific areas, we need to learn to trust God. We need to identify our worry zones and then learn to trust God. Now, I get it. It might kind of sound like I'm contradicting myself, but I, trust is not the ultimate solution to worry, but it is an important step on the journey toward having an invincible defense. Trust is key. If we don't learn to trust, we'll never be able to develop an invincible defense against worry. So we need to trust. And so maybe for you, your first step today is to believe for the first time, or maybe for the first time in a long time, that if God is able to provide for birds, and if he's able to provide for flowers, and he's able to keep all of this world running as he does, maybe, just maybe, he's worthy of your trust in everyday life. Maybe you just need to learn to trust God. Keeping in mind, though, that trust is not the ultimate solution. It's not the ultimate solution, but it is an important step. So identify your worry zones, learn to trust God, understanding that trust will not be the ultimate solution. But then, maybe the bigger, the, the more crucial, and maybe the harder step for all of us is to begin to develop that invincible defense against worry. As Jesus said, to seek treasure in heaven rather than treasure on earth, to serve God rather than stuff, or to seek the kingdom of God and seek God's righteousness. What what does that mean? Well, really we're trying to, I think, develop a heart that wants the right thing. Maybe you could say it this way, we are trying to develop a heart that is wanting what God wants. 
develop a heart that wants what God wants. Because if we want what God wants, then we will want something that's invincible and we'll have an invincible defense against worry. So how do we do that? How do we begin developing a heart that is wanting what God wants? And I think we do that by doing what God does. We develop a heart that wants what God wants by doing what God does. What does God do? What what would that look like on a Monday morning? How do we make that practical? Well, I think that there are two specific ways. When we, we do what God does by 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 what God primarily does is love. And God primarily loves, get this, God primarily loves himself. Now, that might kind of sound weird to us because people in our life that like would self-admit that they love themselves above anybody else, we tend not to like hanging out with those kind of people, right? You know, they're kind of, you know, self-obsessed or they're all about their own needs, but God primarily loves himself. But that's okay in the case of God because God is the ultimate or the supreme being in all of the universe. So if God, track with me, if God were to love something or someone more than himself, he would be essentially committing idolatry, right? Because God's the ultimate supreme being in the universe. So God does primarily love himself. So what what would it look like for you to love God? You know, maybe you're here and you don't have a relationship with God. So all of this has been kind of foggy to begin with. You're not really even sure what it would look like. So maybe for you, your first step in developing an invincible defense against worry is to enter into a loving relationship with God. And you do that by, you know, acknowledging the fact that we're all messed up. We've got problems. We've got sin. And that sin, those bad decisions we've made, they deserve punishment. Punishment from a God that's perfect. But believing the fact that God sent his son, Jesus, who had done nothing wrong, to take the punishment that we deserve for our wrong decisions. Jesus died in our place for our sins. And you can become a a follower of God, a Christ follower, by accepting Jesus as your forgiver and leader. by, By believing that he died for your sins in your place. And then you will enter into a loving relationship with the God who is love. If you have questions about that, one of our pastors will be down front after the service. We would love to talk to you about that. Or maybe, maybe just ask the person who brought you here this morning. Or you know, talk to your community group leader or someone. We would love to help you know how you could be introduced to a loving relationship with God. Or maybe, maybe for you, you already have a relationship with God. And so loving God for you would look like doing what Jesus said. And what Jesus said is that if you love him, you'll keep his commands. So maybe your step if you're a Christ follower, in developing an invincible defense against worry is to obey God by, I mean, love God by obeying him. Love God by obeying him. To live a life of obedience to God that demonstrates your love for him. If we're gonna want what God wants, we need to do what God does. And God primarily loves himself. But he also primarily loves, he also loves people. He also loves people. One of the most famous verses in the Bible, John 3, 16, said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. You've maybe heard that before. God does love people, but God doesn't ever love in theory only. God loves in action. So maybe you're here and what your next step is to do what God does by loving people in action. To prioritize people above stuff on your calendar, in your mental activity. Maybe to serve people with the way that you live. Or maybe it's to live in such a way that you believe that other people are more important than you are. To live a life of service toward other people. Because I believe if we will do what God does by loving him and loving other people, then we will begin to develop a heart that wants what God wants. And when we want what God wants, when our wants are elevated from this temporary stuff of earth to something that's eternal, that cannot be threatened, when what we want is changed, when our heart is transformed from wanting something that's going to rot, that's got an expiration date, to wanting something that will last forever, the kingdom of God, treasure on earth, serving God rather than stuff, when we get to a place where our heart is so transformed that what we want cannot be threatened by the circumstances of our life, then we will have developed an invincible defense against worry because we will want something that cannot be shaken by the circumstances of our life and nothing, nothing will be able to alter that fact. Would you pray with me? God, thanks for an opportunity this morning um, to spend time with people who love you focusing on the fact that you have given us a chance to have an invincible defense against worry. If we will develop a heart that wants what you want, 
then we can come to a place where we don't have to be overwhelmed by the circumstances of our life, where we can live a life free from worry because our wants, the desires of our heart, the treasure that we seek has been so transformed that it has been transformed into something that cannot be threatened by our circumstances, that we can trust you to provide the things that matter most. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus presents us with a decision. A decision whether we're going to seek the kingdom of heaven, we're going to seek treasure in heaven or treasure on earth. Are we going to serve God or are we going to serve stuff? And the decision that we make on that issue will determine whether or not we ever have to worry again. Because if we choose to want something that's invincible, we'll have an invincible defense against worry. So what are we going to do? When we walk out of this room, we're going to be presented again with the same stressors that we had when we walked in. The same difficult circumstances will come piling back on. And in that moment, we have a chance to analyze, to interpret what it is that matters most to us. Because if we respond with worry, then chances are we've placed our heart, our treasure, what we seek on something that can be threatened, something that is going to pass away. But if in that moment, when the stressors come piling back on, if we choose to realign our treasure with a treasure that's reserved in heaven for us through what Jesus Christ did on the cross for our sins in our place, then we will be presented with the opportunity to never worry again and rest in our invincible defense because what we want is completely invincible. We hope that this series has been helpful to you, that in your difficult circumstances, you're able to get off the treadmill of life, to stop and stretch and develop an invincible defense against the worry and difficulties of life. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.